Okay. Um, welcome everyone to uh, our intern meeting. Um, so let's get going. A uh, reminder, uh, not well applies here. So if you're not familiar with it, please familiarize yourself with this. Um, so today we will talk about Depop. I just want to remind you that we have one more meeting uh, next week uh, to talk about uh, a new uh, individual draft, uh, the AS issuer identifier in authorization response. So um, it will be next Monday at the same time here. Um, today, again, it will focus on, on Depop. And um, I think Brian will be um, taking us through this one. Uh, any questions, comments about um, our plan? Okay, so um, Brian, I'll stop sharing and I'll give you a chance to share. Thank you. Uh, we'll and, hopefully be able to figure this out. And before you start, I want to again share that link uh, in the chat here. And people uh, that join, please add your name to the list. Okay, Brian, take it away. Um, take it away. Everyone uh, feels silly even asking, but the slides come up okay? The intro yes. slide, everyone see it? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So we are not meeting in Bangkok, but you know, I love to keep, things, uh, keep some photos around and uh, throw them there. So we should have been in Bangkok, but instead we're having this uh, virtual interim meeting, uh, as Rafet already said, to discuss Depop. So with that said, uh, here we go. So real quick, um, you know, sort of a small group, so I'll try to cruise through the sort of introductory stuff, but I still want to cover this. What What is Depop um, and what isn't it? It's a pragmatic application level sender constraining of access and refresh tokens for OAuth, and does that by binding a key pair in a trust on first use style uh, that's controlled by the client to, to tokens. Um, what it's not is it's not an HTTP signature scheme. It's not a new client to authorization server um, authentication mechanism. And it's certainly not perfect or an infallible solution. It has its, uh, it has its warps, but I, I, you know, it is useful and pragmatic, though not perfect. Real quick overview of what it is. Um, basically, a, this thing called a DPOP proof jot is sent as an HTTP header. Uh, of each HTTP request. And this demonstrates a reasonable level of proof of possession of a key in the context of that particular request. And these proofs are sent the same way with the same syntax and semantics for both kinds of requests to the token, token request for new tokens, the AS, grant type requests, token endpoint requests, as well as to protected resources. Um, the AS uses this proof to bind the tokens that it issues to the key pair that the client has. And the RS uses the proof to verify the bound tokens and make sure that the client presents a proof um, for a key to which the token it receives was actually bound. Uh, the Depop proof jot is sent in a header named Depop, surprisingly, and it looks kind of like this, um, Depop and then the jot. The actual anatomy, the inside bits and pieces of a Depop proof are a jot that hopefully many are familiar with. It's explicitly typed because that's what we do now. We only support asymmetric signatures because uh, it's a, a asymmetric sort of um, protocol flow overall. The key for which the proof of possession is being demonstrated is sent as the JWK header in the JWT. So basically this jot is saying you can verify the signature with this public key. And in doing so, you get some proof that the presenter holds the private key associated with this public key. Um, that's all in the header. Then in the claims itself, we have some pretty minimal information about the HTTP request. The idea here is just enough information to sort of bind this proof to this particular request, and that's the method and the URI. We have a unique identifier, the JTI, that can be used for some level of replay checking. And we have um, the issue.time, which we uh, in the in the document specifies that this proof is only acceptable for a limited window of time relative to the creation time of the proof itself. And being jot, we don't specify anything else here, but certainly other 
claims could be included here at you know the the needs of specific implementations or sort of derivative um, profiles of this particular document. And there's actually some consideration and, and thinking of work being done in that area by a couple of different groups and people. So um, I think it's worthwhile to not have anything more here, but allow for it um, such that extensions can make use of it. Um, when you make an access token request, this should all be familiar. It's an authorization code request, um, exchanging that code for tokens. And the only difference with Depop is that Depop header is included here. And this is uh, the Depop proof specific to this particular request. So it'll have post in it and uh, the URI for the AS with the token endpoint. Assuming that all validates, an access token is returned. And the only difference here is the token type indicates that this is in fact uh, a DPOP bound access token. So the client knows that that is the case. Um, this particular one happens to return a refresh token as well. Um, that refresh token then could be used in a, a later access token request and the same things apply. The DPOP proof is sent as a, a header and um, in the case that this is a public client, in this case it is, that um, refresh token had previously been bound to the same key. So this is a, a way of binding refresh tokens as well for public clients, which is something that we don't have um, via other mechanisms other than MTLS, but that has its, uh, has its own difficulty in deployment and maintenance. So this gives an application level way to bind refresh tokens to client instances. And the presentation of it is the same, um, just the same you would make any other access token request. Um, quick note that we have some new authorization server metadata. So it's just a, um, an array of JWS algorithms supported for uh, DPOP proof JWTs. And by inference, just the existence of this um, indicates general AS support for uh, the DPOP protocol. I'm not sure that's the right word. Profile, we need a better word. Um, and then the actual access tokens themselves uh, for JOT-based access tokens and introspection responses, we specify the way in which the confirmation claim is used to bind the issued access token to the public key from the DPOP proof. And that's via um, the CNF claim, the confirmation claim. And then that contains uh, a member that is the SHA-256 hash of the JWK thumbprint of the DPOP public key. And this is what binds the access tokens to the um, to the client's public key for DPOP. And this isn't the only way to do it. Of course, um, as, as is always true with OAuth, if you have specific agreement between AS and RS, you can do this however you want. But the intent here is to standardize the way that this information is carried for JOT and for introspection, because those are some very commonly used and um, ways of doing access tokens and allow for sort of independent interoperable functionality between um, AS and RS implementations that are not necessarily owned or developed by the same, same group or same provider or whatever. It gives some interoperability to this level. Um, and then protected resource requests are, as you might imagine, sort of similar. You just make your HTTP request to the protected resource. The authorization header uses this DPOP scheme and includes the access token. That access token is bound to the key in the DPOP proof, and the DPOP proof itself is sent in the same way using the DPOP header. Um, there is a 401 authenticate challenge. So if you request a protected resource without a token or without any sort of authentication appropriate, you'll get something like uh, 401 with www authenticate. DPOP as the scheme and Realm here, which is in all these challenges, uh, as well as a way to indicate the algorithms that this protected resource or resource server supports for accepting DPOP proofs. Um, and then if uh, similar challenge or similar but somewhat different challenge to a resource request with an invalid token, um, and that would it's the same DPOP WWW authenticate challenge with the 401, but there's also the error, error description, um, and it can also indicate the, the outs in this case, um, though it's likely not necessary at this point, it's possible. 
These are very similar to the, the bearer challenges, but with the, um, the addition of the Alex grammar to allow for uh, somewhat more dynamic exchange of the supported algorithms for DPOP. And then uh, get into a little bit of history, status updates, all those sorts of things. Nice transition slide here from Frankfurt. Um, so put together a little bit of history of all the DPOP. Um, I won't go through all this here, but basically the last item is uh, our last couple items. We've been in the interim earlier this year, a bunch of other discussions, and just recently on November 18th, published a, an O2 um, revision of this draft. Hopefully, in enough time for people to take a look at it before uh, the, this uh, post virtual 109 interim. So, we didn't actually have any meetings at IETF 109, but this interim follows closely on the heels of it. And yeah, that's where we're at right now on November 30th. Um, so what's new in uh, in the latest draft? And so there's a lot of updates here, but some of the main ones I wanted to touch on and just mention are a pretty broad expanding of the objectives in the draft, um, trying to better lay out sort of what what Depop does, what it doesn't do, and what it's meant to do in terms of protections. Um, Better describing what it would look like to support mixed or transitional type deployments where you have both bearer and DPOP token types in the same deployment, um, and more clearly allow for a uh, bound refresh token, but issued in conjunction with a bearer access token. That's somewhat related to transitional type deployments, but also potentially a worthwhile use case um, uh, sort of indefinitely. So um, there was some wording that, that was backed off a little bit and uh, additional text clarifying that this is in fact possible and legal. Um, did add and require that a protected resource that is su simultaneously supporting both the bearer and DPOP schemes must reject an access token received as a bearer if in fact that token is DPOP bound. And so for a, a resource that's supporting both at the same time, this is a check that prevents against uh, sort of downgrade type usage. Uh, pulled out, removed the case insensitive qualification on the HTM claim check. That's the HTML, or excuse me, HTTP method. It was noted that we had a case insensitiveness there, but it, those are in fact case sensitive, so it made sense to keep the claims um, in line with that. And uh, relaxed a little bit the wording and the requirements around tracking JTI for replay and also qualified the scope in which it has to be tracked uh, by the URI of the request. So a couple points of discussion that have come up um, on the lists in various places that were not yet addressed in the draft uh, that I wanted to raise here and talk about and see if we can get some idea of consensus to move forward. Um, here we've got the uh, a uh, picture of prop, which has already been canceled, but another uh, another um, opportunity to um, overshare photos here. Uh, too bad we're not going to Prague. I love it there, but not happening. Anyway, so those uh, those issues. Here we go. There's a few of them. One of the biggest ones um, that's come up a few times uh, is this issue of sort of freshness of the proof and uh, sort of what the signature itself actually covers on the proof, not not the token or anything else, but what the signature of the proof covers. And the, the biggest issue is basically uh, that malicious code, cross-site scripting type code executed in the context of a browser-based client potentially create DPOP proofs that are valid in the future and exfiltrate or steal those along with tokens. And Together, those stolen proofs and tokens can be used to access protected resources or potentially acquire new access tokens, completely independent of the client application. And future DPOP proofs could be created even for tokens that have not yet been issued. Um, and sort of in conjunction with this also, there's no sort of binding between, the, the binding is from the token to the key. There's no binding from the proof to the token itself, which is what allows for these um, proofs to be created that could potentially be used for tokens 
not even issued yet um, and potentially allow for some swapping of, of tokens uh, if a lot of other sort of, um, I, I guess I would say unlikely events came to be, but trying to give a nod to the uh, potential issue that, that Justin raised previously. There, there's at least the technical possibility that a proof could be used with a different token because there's nothing um, nothing binding the proof to the token. It, it goes the other way around. So kind of the current situation around that is that we have some level of sort of freshness of the proof in the issue that claim. But this doesn't prevent some sort of pre-computation by an adversary who can use the private key but not actually steal the private key. So via cross-site scripting or something, um, that's actually the, the only vector I can think of, uh, an adversary could create these proofs and future date them so they would be valid um, for, you know, for resources at, at some point in the future. This is largely uh, because there's no server contribution to the content of the proof, and at least in part because the token itself is not covered by the proof or the signature of the proof. Um, I will say that not having um, like an ongoing or extensive challenge response piece for the proof itself was a fairly intentional design choice um, for this, and it was aimed at simplicity and having less overhead in, in the deployments. But it does sort of allow for this. So some potential um, options around here. Um, one, quite frankly, is that it's maybe sufficiently okay as it is. Um, this is discussed in the new objective section of the draft and uh, key rotation is recommended as a means to reduce the impact of this. Um, and uh, another issue that, that uh, I don't know how quite to say this, but the, the attack vector that allows for future dating and exfiltrating DPOP proofs also allows for direct use. So by sort of trying to mitigate this future generated exfiltrating, we may potentially add a lot of complexity into the protocol and the implementations themselves while only closing off one variation of an attack that could be used anyway, despite those, those efforts. Um, it kind of gets into uh, like this, this nihilism around cross-site scripting, but pretty much if your application has cross-site scripting vulnerabilities, there's not much that can be done practically to prevent um, attacks through that vector. So just preventing a subclass of those attacks, the exfiltration and usage, I don't know how valuable that really is or if it's worth the added overhead into the protocol itself. That said, um, some other options is we could incorporate a, a hash of the access token or the access token itself, but probably a hash just for reasonable size considerations into the DPOP proof. Um, that would limit at least the scope of what could be done from those exfiltrated things to only using tokens currently issued. Um, this has the same rough mitigation value as having the client rotate keys, but does in the hands of the protocol and not require the client to take some action. Um, although I, um, I start to wonder whether it's, you know, there's a, there's a trade off of the, the protocol itself enforcing something at the cost of complexity for everyone versus the, uh, the individual implementations of clients making some action to mitigate something at, at the cost of just a little bit of extra complexity for them. It also sort of, at least to me, raises the, the question of whether we should be including other types of artifacts into the proof if we were to do this. Um, like, is there value in, in having some kind of coverage of the, the author JSON code refresh token and maybe other grants? Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure, but it sort of begs the question if we were to do it in one place and not the other. Um, but that's one, one potential option to work with there. Uh, another option, uh, not necessarily exclusive to that, but would be to allow the server to provide, uh, likely via some kind of challenge, some contribution to the proof. Um, in the context of the current design, at least when I think about it, this feels a little bit awkward to work into it in a, in a nice way. 
Um, maybe I'm just not seeing it, but it, it, I struggle to see how it can kind of fit in cleanly or elegantly. I hate to use that word, but hopefully that makes sense. Like it just, it just sort of doesn't quite fit right, particularly for interactions with the AS. And certainly a, a challenge per resource indication of all seems completely untenable. Um, it's already pretty expensive protocol. And if we were to have a challenge response re request on every single call, uh, I, I just think that's too much overhead. So we need to consider some way to, to amortize the cost of the challenge over, you know, many subsequent requests, uh, which is likely possible, but certainly, um, you know, needs to be figured out and, and considered and, and likely has its own complications of, of some kind of state maintenance and so forth. Um, and of course, the other bullet here is other because there's there's probably other ways to to consider here, but I I don't know what they are, and I I think that some combination of uh, one or the other two of these is is probably the most likely path forward. Um, so that is the the sort of the first of I think I have three largely open issues. Um, I don't think in the chairs, should I just go through all of them um, and then come back to discussion on potentially each of these items? Or do you want to try to hit that now? Or maybe there is no discussion. I think it, it would be probably better to do a discussion right now because if you cover three and then people start, like you have yeah. to do again for what they should <laughs> just to start that discussion right now. So, and I see Dick in the line here, but before I, I let Dick chime in here, I, I will post the link here. And if you haven't added your name, please go and add your name to the list. Uh, go ahead, Dick. Brian, did you have a chance to look over the binding JWT that I posted to the list? Yeah, um, it's not, I mean, I don't quite understand the motivations and rationale, and it's not really something that um, I don't know how to say this. It's a, it's of interest or need to me, so that's why I've not responded. Okay, well, because that would also solve this problem, I think. Um, uh, maybe so. Yes, I, I guess you could include it in other. Be it virtue of you know introducing a whole third artifact. Um, so, Dick, do, do you want to describe for people that did not read that? Do you want to kind of briefly talk about that? Or? Sure. The idea is that you have, as opposed to putting the uh, <clears throat> hash of the key or the the fingerprint of the key into the access token or refresh token that you can use your existing access token and refresh tokens and you put a hash of the token and a hash of the client's key into a separate token and then that's a binding token and so then the uh, resource server verifies that binding token with a you know some key that it has from the access server, which could be the same key that signed a JWT access token, but enables you to use any existing access token and refresh token. Um, and that then that binding then binds the access token to the key separately in, in, in both directions. So it solves this problem. It also makes it easier for people to deploy without having to change their code for access tokens or refresh tokens. I can imagine, you know, there's lots of people that have deployments out there that are working. Something like this would be able to be deployed as a separate middleware layer for doing DPOP without impacting existing running code. Um, it's looking at the access token for authorization. Okay, thank you. Um... Anybody else has any comments, questions? Any thoughts about what uh, Brian just described here? Or Dick's idea?
Okay. Um, Tosin speaking, just one question to Dick. Um, I, I don't understand how the the binding between the access token and the key material is being established because in DPOP it's the AS that in the end the tests. I, I have seen that that uh, a, a proof of private key. So I, I hear with a test that uh, they, uh, whoever is in possession of a private key corresponding to a certain public key um, um, was issued that access token. And I don't I don't see how that this this is binding it's, is established with your proposal. I may be wrong, but I, I believe it's because there's a third artifact introduced that's returned by the authorization server that basically ties the key to the access token, and then the client has to present the access token and that binding thing, as well as the proof. Okay, which means the authorization server needs to be extended to support that feature as well. And yes. um, I, I don't see how this is even uh, it, how this is easier than just extending the access token and do it in an opaque way. It, it, I agree with you. I argue that it's it's changing different sort of bits and pieces of the protocol, and depending on how maybe things have been implemented, it might be easier based on the layering. But all the implementations that I know, you know, mucking with the contents of the access token itself is is relatively straightforward and simple versus, um, or, or at least manageable versus trying to issue additional artifacts is is less so. So I, I agree with you, but I'm trying to, uh, yeah, you know, I don't know if the word is speak, speak on behalf of what Dick was trying to do. Yep, that was an accurate characterization. It's a it's a, a separate artifact that enables you to use whatever you have to do. Okay. Any other comments, questions? People? Yes, um, Philip Skokan here on zero. Yep. Um, so what I what I don't get is how how the resource server would be able to figure out that this is a bound token if the client simply omits sending uh, the proper token type in the header in the authorization header in the you know the the, the proper scheme and also the uh, the the binding um, the, the the second header with the binding artifact because what we have now is that the the resource server can do introspection for both JWT tokens by looking into the claims as well as talking uh, talking to the introspection endpoint when they are opaque tokens and it is able to figure out that this is actually a bound token that it should process the binding check for. I don't believe that's possible there. So either you can't have an RS that supports both at the same time, or you just um, are subject to the possibility of a downgrade with that, that style. That, was, that is definitely a, a negative of the approach. Agreed. Okay. Thanks. There are lots of noise in the background, so if you're not speaking, please go on mute. Um, Mike, can you hear us? Mike Jones, can you Hi. hear us? Mike Jones from Microsoft. Um, I know that a long time ago when we were meeting in person, Amazon and I think um, is that it's interested in being able to use symmetric key cryptography efficiencies. Um, I know that, Brian, you and I, and I think I'm probably whiteboarded out again when we could stand in front of whiteboards, how to do that. Um, writing that up and describing how what would happen to the protocol to be able to use symmetric keys? It, yes, I, I have thought about it quite a bit. Basically, it's a it would detail out a, a derivation anyway on the idea that Neil presented around the same time. Um, 
it's my assertion that it's a completely different protocol at that point. It's different enough that it would it would be something different. Um, thereby being different. Can I say different a few more times? But it, it it's really completely distinct in the way that the flow works. And um, when we were first uh, early this year, we had an interim on pop in general, and. More or less at that point, I, I put forward sort of depop as a, a working item or attempting to codify, write up, and actually specify uh, Neil's idea in, in more depth and, and so forth. And the working group at that point indicated a strong interest in pursuing depop. Um, so I tabled that other work. Doesn't mean it couldn't come back, but it's it's not, I consider it sort of closed for this particular document and would need to be. Its own thing and, and considered distinctly, and it's not something that we can keep sort of considering reintroducing into this document. It, it's different enough that it just doesn't work. And so it's, I don't know how to say it, it it's sort of closed with respect to DPOP. DPOP is a, a asymmetric scheme, and, and that's just what it is. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Mike. Hey, Dave? Um, yeah, hi. I, I suppose, yeah, Brian, the in, including a hash of the, you know, access token and, and other other ones. Like, is is it mainly just the size consideration? You know, why why we want to maybe not not do that? It just, I suppose, you know, if if this was on 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 some sort of back end protocol, I'd have said, yeah, we should we should one hundred percent do that. I can't like I can't see apart from like the size, I can't see many negatives to in, including those. Um, so the hash, the size, the hash, I don't think is a major concern. I think a hash could be added without materially impacting anything. It does bring the downside of having to um, specify a hash algorithm and either ingrain it or build some sort of um, hash agility, which has many of its own problems. So there's some consideration there, but, you know, they can be dealt with, uh, as you know. Um, there is, to be honest, there's some uh, resistance on my side, basically just because of the the uh, my attachment to the simplicity of the model and the symmetry between the two types of proof that the client always sends this proof in the same way, regardless of, of how it's accessing things. Um, so it doesn't need to make decisions about what to put in there and what to hash in the context of what request. It just sends a proof, it's related to the request and sends it off. But I do think you know, that said, there's probably worthwhile breaking that, that little idea in order to, to do something with the access token. And that could be done relatively simply. I get into my own head and thinking about, well, if we're going to do that for access tokens, then, then maybe it's worthwhile for these other artifacts. And cleanly specifying sort of how and what artifact you put in there and have based on the different grant types and requests, which are themselves an extensible mechanism, um, starts to get a little confusing and, and potentially sort of ugly. Like, do we say, okay, it's the authorization code for code? refresh token for refresh and then nothing for other grants or those grants have to specify it. Um, and those grants may have already been written. So what do we do? And it just, it starts to get a little ugly from layering and specification perspective, um, which sort of helped me to push back on it a little bit. But as I, as I think about it and even talk about it here, I'm wondering if maybe not doing anything for the grant types, doing the hash of the access token for resource access might be a, uh, a good worthwhile middle ground kind of thing, largely because of the complexity. And also I'm not seeing really where you get the value in, in hashing on the other artifacts. I don't see what that would prevent or, or protect against. Whereas the, there is value in, in doing the access token. So um, I've talked in a lot of circles there, but maybe that um, explains a little bit of, of my thinking around it and some of my hesitation to do anything with it. But I'm thinking more and more that that doing the access token and only the access token might might be a good sort of compromise. Yeah, I mean, I yeah, I I, I do think yeah, you make some very valid valid points there, and I think your your point about like 
that the type of attack vectors that make those attacks you know viable you know like it you know w will this really in in reality protect um you know if, if, if there's been that that level of um of, you know vector exposed anyway so yeah I'm, I, I'm not sure but yeah that that definitely does sound you know i suppose it's just if there is the ability to think of the kind of mtls i know it's on a, on a different one just because it's on that transport layer you know it, it can't be replayed in, in the same way um you know so if it was possible um yeah to bind it to the access token itself that like it does seem like it would be sensible but i suppose if we can't can if, if we can't say that 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 the, you know there are definite attack factors that closes down then you know it's not really working. I mean, for the access token, I think there are some, at least that it does close down. Maybe that can be achieved in other ways, but but there are some known ones. Whereas the other ones, I'm I'm less sure about, um, and that that just sort of happily coincides with the other ones being harder to specify too. So I, I guess that's sort of where I I'd lean right now. Um, I know we can't make decisions on the call, but that's, yeah. Yeah, so maybe we can continue that discussion um, on, on the list, uh, Brian, just to kind of uh, hopefully find a resolution to this. Um, thanks, Dave. Dennis. Yes, thank you. Well, I just sent a message uh, recently on the on the list uh, about uh, uh, tonight, well, a few minutes before the meeting, and I got a response from Brian. I, I believe that we don't speak uh, from the same thing. I'm not speaking in my email about the heap proof uh, token sent by the client, but of the token generated by the AS. And section 8.1, which is part of the security consideration section, is not the right place to state what kind of processing should be done by, by the ARS when receiving both an access token and a depot proof token. The text says, so basically the, the text for what should be the core of the document, it doesn't prevent to explain better the ID in section 8.1, that it should not be only in section 8.1. But in section 8.1, there is something important that is written. First, there is a must, and I don't believe that must should be in security consideration section, that should be in the core of the document. The sentence is the following, servers must only accept DPOP proof for a limited time window after the I-80 time, preferably only for a relatively brief period. Well, I believe that this is not the right way to handle that. Uh, some client may wish to be able to reuse honestly uh, the same proof and the same token more than once a day because they will do the different connection to the same RS in the same day. So, Currently, the draft is thinking that there should be only a brief period, and the discussion about the uh, number 32 and 38 are I believe that when, when you issue a token, it can be valid for a full day because your attributes are not going to change in a few seconds. Well, if uh, AS believes that the token shall be only valid during a few minutes or seconds, then it used the expiration date in the token. So I was speaking of the expiration date in the token, not the expiration okay, you date. The, the okay, but you made the you made the comment about the proof, and this draft is about the proof. So I don't I don't know where you want to uh, <laughs> expirations in the token themselves. It's an orthogonal issue. It's something completely different. So it's not relevant to this. And I don't I don't even know how to to respond to that because you're talking about things that aren't even part of the draft. Uh, well, I do have some other issues that 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 I'd like to discuss to actually move forward 
with this. So, uh, can we can we move on? The discussion was about the time window, and the discussion is not finished about the time window. But at the the RSI, session was about a point on the document that was the time window for the acceptability of the DPOT proof. And then you said something, I guess, about the access token having an expiration claim, uh, although you didn't clarify that, which doesn't make any sense. It's not about this document. Well, reread my, my email and you will discover what is wrong in your opinion. Okay, so let's, let's stop here, guys. So I, I, I'm assuming that there is some misunderstanding there. So can we continue that on that mailing list just to make sure you guys are talking about the same thing? Uh, we're not going to be able to resolve it here. I, uh, that's fair, but I, I don't have time or energy to address things that, that don't make sense or that aren't, aren't relevant. So I, I'm not going to expend any more energy on it. Um, okay, so. Well, I mean, it's difficult to achieve consensus and write these documents, even when we're all talking about the same thing. Um, and I, there are limited resources and time and energy. I, that's just the reality of it. Yeah, I, I know, I know. <laughs> so, so let's, uh, may, maybe Dennis, Send an email again and and see if you can clarify what are you what are you talking about there and and, um, and we'll take it from there right uh, if it's out scope it's out scope what, what what can you do right uh, okay let let's keep going now um, I, I, like on this one I guess we we still want to continue this discussion on the mailing list uh, Brian but I I don't I didn't see any kind of conclusion here it's not, there is lots of noise in the background if you're not speaking please go mute um that might be me I apologize okay no worries <laughs> okay so i don't get a, a strong sense of consensus around this i uh, am personally somewhat conflicted so i'm happy to take it back to the list but if yeah if there's other strong opinions or, or thoughts here um i could drive to to a resolution, I, I would very much like to hear them. Okay, so so let's let's then maybe take that to the mailing list and continue the discussion. I, Fair enough. So so okay, I think Justin is in the queue. Justin, do you want to say something related to this uh, slide? Yes, uh, just very quick. Uh, I just want to point out that for a lot of these, it's important that we keep in mind the the first bullet on the right hand side there, in that sometimes we say. It, we make the choice to say, yeah, this is this is a known uh, this is a known hole. Um, here's how you might avoid it, but this protocol is not going to be where it is specifically addressed. And um, I I think that just because there is a shortcoming in a system doesn't necessarily mean that we have to address it um, in a particular way here. Uh, which because I was the one that brought up the the token coverage question. Uh, I wanted to, to be clear that, um, in my view, we could address that either by adding an access token hash, which personally I'm in favor of, but we could also address it by saying, hi, this signature doesn't cover the access token, so watch out for this. Okay. I, yeah, totally agreed. And not specific to, to the issue you brought up, that's sort of my point in the first bullet under the ideas is, and it's okay, and we discuss it um, and try to warn against it. But at the same time, the cost value of adding something that being access to token hash is maybe worthwhile enough to to do it. And so I'm, I'm maybe sort of leaning in that direction now. So, do people here? Is is anybody here? Would anybody here object to this kind of direction? You mean including the access token in the in, in the uh, signature calculation or the? No, no, like not doing anything about this, right? The, the first bullet at the right, like the first sub bullet at, at the, the right side of the slide, right?
So it's it, like I was sort of advocating for, but then also hedging and saying, well, maybe it'd be better to to just throw a hash of the access token in the group. So I yeah, maybe it comes down to those two, and I can try to summarize. Um, yeah, those and, and get that to the list. Yeah, let, let's do that, uh, Brian. That that's better. Uh, just to make sure everyone is clear yeah. about that, that, the the options that we're talking about here. Okay. 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 Thanks, Brian. Yeah, L let's go to the next one. Yeah. Alrighty. Uh, maybe I can figure out how to use my machine. Okay. Another issue that's come up now twice uh, anyway is it, it's been suggested that uh, for resource access, having the JBK in the proof makes it really easy to just use that key to validate the signature on the proof and call it good thereby missing the checking of the binding to the AT itself um, in the in the confirmation claim. Um, because it's sort of a two-step process. You have to validate the proof and then check that the access token binding is in fact to that proof. And the, the statement was that that latter check is potentially something that will be missed enough that it's worth considering. Um, that possibility was compared to the out of none, uh, which I thought was a, a bit much, um, but it's sort of the same kinds of things uh, in terms of is the protocol as it's currently designed making it easy enough or too easy to make a mistake that is believed to be you know common or likely enough that it should be changed um, to avoid the potential for that mistake. Um, and so the, the current situation is we send the full JVK in the proof and there's a hash of the JWK in the access tokens confirmation claim. And it's been suggested that missing that check is potentially a foot, foot gun here, uh, something that we could avoid with a different protocol design. That said, um, there's been only one person sort of advocating this position. Um, I've responded to it and sort of come around to the idea somewhat. Uh, it is maybe, a, you know, from a consensus point of view, it's, you know, it's one person's opinion at this point. Um, but um, I wanted to raise it here. And really, as I see it, we have two options. Uh, one is, again, it's fine the way it is. Just leave it. Um, it's nice to have the symmetry between the AS and the RS access with the proof. Um, it's very, very similar to the way that um, MTLS and it's defunct now, but the way that token binding worked in that the key proof happened sort of elsewhere and the access token was bound to the key. Um, and the idea of checking the binding in a protocol that's about binding access tokens feels kind of fundamental. And although it's possible to be admitted, that feels um, like something that if you're going to go to the trouble of implementing a, a binding protocol, you should go ahead and check the binding. Um, but another option would be to change things around a little bit. And rather than a hash of the key, include the full JWK in the access tokens confirmation claim and emit it, emit the key entirely from the DPOP proof on resource access. And the argument behind this, again, is that it's much less error prone because you can't just grab the key from the proof and verify it. You have to pull the actual key from the confirmation, thereby sort of implicitly checking the binding just by virtue of pulling the key. Um, so it would be really moving, yeah, just by putting the full JBK into the access tokens confirmation claim and then having it not included in the proof itself. On resource access only, you still need it for authorization server access because that's where it finds out the key. Um, and yeah, the, this would potentially be less error prone in implementations. It is somewhat smaller in terms of the total amount of data conveyed between the two artifacts. Um, and there's always trade offs with who's caching what and whether it's a token um, that's requiring introspection or self contained or whatever. But just in general, um, it would be a key rather than a key and a hash traveling between the two artifacts. And it has a nice benefit of not, um, not requiring us to define a hash, hash function, um, which 
yeah, is, is a somewhat side benefit, although it sounds like we might consider adding a hash function somewhere else, so it's not like it gets rid of it entirely. Um, yeah, so those are the, those are really the two options. I even that in both, um, and I guess the only other consideration is even though we're in draft here, we we would be looking at what's effectively a breaking change um, if in the in the second bullet, which is always okay in draft stage, but maybe you know something to think about if if we went in that direction as well. So that that said, I'm certainly interested in. Um, getting to consensus between um, one of these two options and, and more or less, you know, picking one and, and moving forward and putting it behind us. Okay. Any, anybody has any thoughts? Justin. Yeah, so I, I definitely get both thrusts of the argument here that, um, or arguments here that Brian's presented. I think you've done a good job capturing that. And I just want to add that there's a lot of other things, other really bad things that can go wrong if the RS isn't checking the aspects of the access token beyond just its immediate presentation validity. Um, you know, it's, it's, it is aligned with algnon in that it it makes it easy to put a premature finish line uh, in your code and not do any checking past that. But there's a lot of other bad stuff that can happen if, say, the token doesn't have the right scopes or was issued to a different client or was issued to the wrong user or any number of other artifacts uh, dealing with that token beyond just that it was presented with a signature with the key that it was presented with. Okay. Thanks, Justin. Anybody else has any comments? Daniel. Daniel? Daniel, can you hear us? Yeah. Now? No, yeah. Excellent. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I'd just uh, like to add. Uh, so I think this is a very valid point, and we've seen in the past how people uh, implement uh, such things wrongly. But um, I think there's also a lot of value already when we have a good description on uh, on an algorithm uh, how to how to check these things. Um, so when we make the spec very explicit on what to check and in which order, I think this can already be um, a good good uh, step to avoiding these kind of issues. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I agree, but not sure where that leaves us. With this. <laughs> Whether it's enough or yeah. Okay. Any anybody else has any comments and questions? We have three minutes here, guys. So we're not going to be able to finish uh, the last uh, open issue, um, Brian. So, um, and I I see that you have really two important open issues here. So. Uh, I'm I, I'm thinking that we might need a, a follow up meeting to continue this. Um, is that? Uh, go ahead. Uh, well, let me let me take this one on the list too, and at least see if we can gather some feedback to to try to get to consensus. It should be easy to summarize because it's you know A or B. Please pick one, and we'll move forward. And okay. last issue is hopefully really short. So if you don't mind, I'm just going to pound through it on the slide. Yeah, go ahead. Um. If figure out how to advance the slide. Oh my God. This is embarrassing. Seems to have. Apologize. 
right, I'll just summarize. Um, it was the fact that um, DPOP is not a client authentication method, um, and we go out sort of out of our way to say that, but we're seeing situations where um, asymmetric stuff going, asymmetric client auth and asymmetric binding, you get the combination of DPOP and private key job for client authentication, which is a little bit weird um, to have both of those artifacts um, on the requests that are doing, in some ways, very, very similar things. And by doing some pre-registration or pre-configuration of keys, um, DPOP could be turned into an OAuth client authentication of the AS method uh, pretty easily. Um, basically pre-registration in some way to carry the client identifier, um, and I think and then it's done. And it simplifies at least the, the, the chance where you would otherwise have private key jot in there. And so um, it seems like an easy win. I was wondering if people are interested in having that specified somewhere, either in this document, which I actually am not a big fan of, because I think maybe it confuses and complicates things. Um, doing a new document would be relatively short and simple, but specify it there, um, or uh, just forget it and, and um, pretend we never had this discussion. Okay, I, I'm not gonna be like we, we are out of time here, so uh, I want to I want to um, ask uh, oh, if, if they haven't um, added their name to the list, please do that. Um, Brian. Um, Let's start with with open like sending those open issues to the list, and if you can close them, that would be great. Otherwise, uh, we could consider a meeting to just complete this. Sure. Let's start with the list, and we'll go from yeah. there. Thanks. Perfect. Okay. Thank you, Brian, and thank you all for joining. Appreciate it. Thank you, Brian. Ciao. Thank you, guys. Brian. Bye. Thanks, folks. Thank you.